Having a Gas is the podcast that talks to the great and the good of the creative industries, and in particular finds out what makes great music for film, for TV, for commercials, for dancing to, for cooking to, for f***ing to, and more. Today, I'm having a gas with Karen James, who is the commercial director at Chief, one of the most prolific and highly regarded film production companies outside of London. And Karen has worked on client side, agency side, and now at the production side, so there's very little that she doesn't know. Are you in an art gallery, judging by the painting, or is that just your abode? No, this is this is my kitchen, um, yeah. which I sort of created a bit of a cafe vibe because um, everyone was hovering around the sink all the time. <laughs> so I thought if I created a nice sort of cafe area, I could get the family to back off and leave me alone when I'm preparing meals. Um, so yeah, and this this is a new addition, the painting. Uh, it's a friend who's a local artist and. Um, paints pictures of the Bolin. I uh, don't know whether you've done any walking down there in lockdown, but it's very pretty and uh, and cheerful. So, um, but I am a bit of an art lover, um, yeah. a regular at the Whitworth in Manchester when it's open. Great. Um, so, yes. <laughs> we'll have to make sure we get a link to the artists somewhere we can find their work because obviously it's always yeah. good to promote local stuff. Okay, thank you. That would be that would be lovely. And you can see, I can see you fending with the cat, and I think that's going to be a pervasive problem throughout the interview. I might, I might have to, um, I might have to lock him out. They, they always seem to. Whenever I start talking on Zoom, uh, they always seem to think that's a cue to get involved. But yeah. um, I think we're all right for the minute. Good, good, good. I think. Um, uh, I saw on Twitter the other day someone said something like do you remember the absolute nightmare about a year ago when almost a year ago now when working mm-hmm. from home was a novel thing something new and everyone was going oh you know taking pictures saying my cat's doing my work today ha 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 yeah <laughs> and, then, and, and, then it, and then it just gets a bit tedious doesn't it and um, yeah and also there's been the odd sort of cat's bottom in in a Zoom video, which is really not great. So yeah, the honeymoon <laughs> is over. But um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So what's what's going on at Chief at the moment? I mean, are, are people in? Are people not in? What's going on? Yeah, good question. Well, um, I personally, I've been working from home quite a lot because I'm not in a shoot critical role, and um, we've been very very protective of of the directors and producers uh, to make sure that they're sort of fighting fit and and able to to deliver on planned shoots, Mm -hmm. uh, of which there have been plenty. Um, We've been lucky in that we have been shooting throughout uh, the the past 12 months, obviously always in um, accordance with APA guidelines. Mm. Um, And uh, yeah, I mean... You know, you won't be surprised to know that there's been a huge amount of comedy scripts coming in. So our comedy directors, Ben Tong and uh, Chris Cottom, have been super busy. Um, Chris Cottom is normally based in L.A. and mm-hmm. he uh, he had to get the last plane out of L.A. before the... Uh, before the borders were shut, um, and we've hidden his passport, so he's right. not. <laughs> we're not letting him go back. <laughs> if it was me, I'd be staying firmly and squarely in Los Angeles, weather-wise. I don't know about <laughs> well, you. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. But no, I but, get it. It's a it's a hierarchy, at chief, and you're going to suck people back when they're somewhere you'd rather be. So you know, it's like you don't get to be out of Manchester if we have to be locked down here. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think you know he's been so busy, and there's been some great projects on. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's he's. Quite Quite happy uh, for the for the time being, but I would imagine he'll be he'll be itching to get to get back home um, yeah. as soon as his schedule allows. I know I would. Um, yeah. So this is really cool because. Um, I was interesting. I was interested by what you said. You said there's you know lots of comedy scripts coming in, which is unsurprising. Is that is that is that more than usual? Yeah, I would say it, it's probably it's probably double. But you know, if you think about the way people have handled um, the various sort of lockdown situations, you know, there's a ton of memes on you know every WhatsApp group you're in. There's there's memes circulating all the time and and what have you. It's just been a coping mechanism for everyone, hasn't it? Um, so so yeah, no, it's not surprised us, but um, and you know we've been glad for our comedy directors to be super busy. Yeah. Um, but it would be nice to see a bit more variety coming in, you know, as we as we open up a bit more. Um, 
but uh, but yeah you know we all need a laugh don't we uh, i mean we 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 all behind the um comic comic relief uh, promo that's been out with, I don't yeah. know if you've seen it with Ramesh Ranganathan yeah. uh, about unleashing your funny self. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was, that was Ben Tong and um, the talk talk, uh, new talk talk ad that's just out uh, again, that was Ben Tong. So um, Ben. Made with our, ben, uh, with our, with our good friends at the AM partnership, Andy and Emma. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Love those guys. Um, so uh, yeah, and um, no, and we, I think we worked with you not on comedy but on Wildlands, didn't we? That's right. Actually, that breaks open something I was interested to know about, Chief. So mm. a lot of people like us uh, stay pretty firmly and squarely in the world of advertising. Obviously, all of us aspire to get into long form drama, documentary, and film, all of that mm-hmm. stuff. But you, you've got that covered, haven't you, Chief? You're very much like a three sixty you know, all, all types of moving image. You know, we, obviously we worked on a documentary for Ubisoft, but I understand mm-hmm. there's a lot of music video as well. Talk to me mm-hmm. about the whole, how does it work? Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's a really good point. It, um, in fact, we are one of um, 30 <laughs> of televisuals, top 30 indies. Um, and the way that we sort of achieved that, I and mean, if you don't know what that means, it, it basically means we're in the premiership of, film production companies. Yeah. Uh, and the and the, the main reason we made it into that top 30 was because of the diversity of work that Chief does. So, um, yes, music videos, TVCs, um, long-form documentaries, brand films, uh, increasingly YouTube series, video on demand, the, the, the whole gamut um, we do. I, I, I think it's fair to say that the documentary side of things is a real passion of one of our founders, Colin Offland, who produced and directed Wildlands. Yeah. Um, if he's if he's in the office as opposed to out filming somewhere uh, like Bolivia or um, North Korea, then he's you know he's he's less happy than he might otherwise be. <laughs> yeah, but something that yeah. you I think have managed to achieve at chief, which is a difficult sentence, achieve at chief. Yeah. Uh, is, um, I would be uh, worried that, no, not worried. What, would I, what am I saying? It's that I wouldn't have been surprised if it had turned into, you know, something akin to uh, a business where one personality dictates the direction of the work. So, you know, obviously Colin's a very uh, high profile dude and has made a lot mm-hmm. of cool stuff. And uh, often production companies basically serve to facilitate the projects that those kind of individuals want to do. That hasn't happened with Chief, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like it has its own um, center of gravity now, which is really cool. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a unique culture at at Chief. I've I've worked in a lot of places, but um, Chief, it's it's such a creative business. It's almost anti-corporate in a way. And that allows individual creativity to drive, um, I think, the diverse um, uh, director base also helps. And the fact that we've been really keen to bring through young directors, which is increasingly difficult, actually, because... um, uh, the, the lower budget opportunities uh, are, not, are not coming through now as 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 readily as they used to. And why is and, that? Because a lot of people yeah. tell me that the higher budget opportunities are the ones that aren't coming through. So that's interesting. That. Yeah, I think it's because a lot of agencies have um, taken work in in house at the at the sort of lower budget end, mm-hmm. um, and that those were traditionally where the areas where we might give projects to to up and coming directors. Yeah, exactly. So that's been a bit more difficult. But um I mean often music videos provide that opportunity and they also provide, you know, often quite an open brief. So it's it's an area where a young director can really um you know explore their creativity and their ideas. Um so so yeah, but it's it's something that Chief's always been very much committed to is is bringing through new talent. Yeah, that's really, uh, it's it's good that you're striving to do that. And I'm thrown back to 
11 years ago when I was 17 and I was convinced that my destiny was I was going to be a film director. That's before I was going to be a rock star. And so... <laughs> there's uh, still time. You're only a baby. <laughs> well, <what? laughs> so before, before this becomes all about me, which God help us if it does. Um, the point is when I was 17, I was desperate to be a filmmaker. And imagine someone's like that. They're like, uh, mm. somehow get a conversation with you and they say, Karen, I have, uh, you know, m- made this body of work. I can shoot, but I've never owned my own camera. How do I progress? How do I make the next step to becoming a director? What is it that you look for when you're taking people on? Does it matter if they've got no professional CV or? Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. It, it, would, um, it would be about their individual sort of look and um, look and style and uh, what kind of genre they're looking to get into and whether that fits with Chief's roster and the type of, of work that, that comes into Chief. So, um, you know, an example would be uh, a, 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 we tend to like a really urban style, something sort of urban and edgy, uh, the kind of thing that fits with um, uh, music videos, which, you know, obviously, I've, so as I've just sort of mentioned, is quite a good uh, sort of early stomping ground for a director. So, yeah, it would really just be about individual flair and, and style and, yeah. and vision. Yeah, and so we, it, we would supply all the kits, so... Yeah, of course, that's the good news. And so, but it's that you're, it's that what you're really looking for is the talent, not the, I don't know. I feel like once I had gone into the creative industry, uh, you know, when you're on the outside with your nose pressed up against the glass, mm-hmm. you imagine that it's this kind of ruthless Machiavellian, no one's interested, mm-hmm. no one wants to give you opportunities. And then when you're on the yeah. other side, you realize you're desperate looking for talent out there. But the problem is, certainly when you're, the, you know, the age I was describing before, when you're 16, 17, mm-hmm. you kind of imagine that all of your potential is actual reality. It's like, well, I think I could be great, therefore I am. And so yes. a lot of people get their kind of bubble burst quite early in life before they have to work towards it, so... Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, uh, if you look at the way some of the directors have come through from Chief, I mean, some of them have come through from being runners. So uh, i give you the example of, of Yoni Weisberg, who's a brilliant director. He's an incredibly intelligent, erudite uh, person. He's not quite um, sort of up and coming anymore. He's he's. I think he's in his early thirties. Might mm-hmm. tell me off now if I if he's still under thirty. But um, and uh, he he started off as a runner, so you know he was emptying bins, getting you water on set, you know, doing all that stuff that yeah. runners have to do. Uh, and 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 he did it, and he was you know he's got a reputation for being a great runner. You know, nothing was was too difficult for him um but behind that that you have this fierce intellect um he's also a brilliant editor he's technically very capable he's very versatile but to 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 get on the uh, on the ladder and to get started and to learn the ropes despite having graduated film school he you know, he he did what needed to be done. He um, he started started off in a you know the re- the most junior role you can. Yeah, yeah, that's a really important thing for uh, people just leaving, let's say their. Uh, their adolescence and, you know, I, I think university is st- still falls within adolescence these days. Certainly it did for me. When they're just exiting that point, it's very important to know that it's very much um, jumping into a huge pond, you know, and don't expect to be a big fish. And uh, if you're keen to just do the graft, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there will be an opportunity for you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, what you were hinting at there is... Uh, to young people, you know, a month can feel like a year, can't yeah. it? You know, you, you, you're sort of thinking, well, I'm, you know, I'm this big shot. I've done this uh, um, high profile directing course. Yeah. And, I can't wait another know. three years. That's yes, like a decade. exactly. You know, I'm not going to empty bins and, yeah. um, you know, uh, carry kit out of the, uh, out of the van and load it up, etc. Yeah. Um, but really it's, I think if you're if you're smart enough to realise that 
every minute on set is a valuable learning opportunity, yeah. you know, getting to understand everyone's roles. On a big set, you, you know, you've got so many different crew, all with sort of finite different roles. Um, uh, you know, understanding, uh, you know, getting to, to, to grips with all that is... Um, you know, is is something to to think. You're actually really quite lucky to be in that in that position. Yeah, yeah. And the number of people you can learn from uh, there <laughs> yeah. is is yeah. If if you are wise enough to basically just be a radar and let information come in. Yeah, it's a sponge. Soak it all up. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, but that's plenty about Chief, plenty about the industry, and we need to talk about you because uh, one of the reasons that you're such an asset to Chief, I, as far as I can tell, is because of the immense experience that you bring with you. And so why don't you give us the, let's say, the, the, the contents page of the book and tell us roughly, you know, you went from here to here and what was in between. Yeah, well, I, I have uh, I have sort of messed around a bit. I, I think if you if you're being kind, you might say you know that I've got a 360 uh, view of a project because I've been on the agency side, the client side, film production. I've also a bit of a, been a bit of an entrepreneur. I set up a fashion business with my sister, which is doing really well, and she runs that. Um, but actually, I was, I was thinking earlier, I'm a bit like sort of marketing Madonna, you know, just constantly reinventing myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I started off at, uh, not a bad place to start really, was M- McCann's in Manchester um, as an account exec. And that was actually a really a really good grounding because I think, you know, as an account, as an account handler, you are um, taking the client's brief. So you are owning uh, a problem uh, yes. and you are then uh, briefing that into creative teams. Um, you're then selling that back to the client and then you sort of, and then you're producing it um, so it's, it's the, you know, all those sort of basic um, uh, pillars in, in that role in terms of client service, appreciating creativity, problem solving, getting on with people. Uh, it's, you know, I, I consider that to be, to be quite a, a good grounding. I think I was fortunate there. I mean, it was um, like 100 years ago now and... Um, um, yeah, I was sort of just thinking about it earlier that we used to have um, we used to have these things called job bags. I, d- I d- very much doubt they exist anymore. But it was um, I mean because now nobody has any paper on their desk, do they? You know, no. we're all minimalist. But you used to have these A2 envelopes, and if it was a really big project, by the end of it, it would be this giant thing that you could you could barely lift it, and you know it would have bits of people's lunch in it and you know goodness knows what was in the bottom of there but um but yeah that that was so instead uh, of piling up gigabytes upon gigabytes of data for a project you would just have a huge thick memorandum and presumably uh, somewhere in places like uh, what's it called is it Bonis Hall um, yes it was Bonis Hall yeah in, presumably in places like that there's a kind of Indiana Jones warehouse full of uh, all these project <laughs> folders yeah use. I bet there is yeah. I bet there is all those old job bags gathering dust <laughs> yeah the kind of things we just don't get with um, the digital world once you delete it end of but you went from McCann and uh, where was next was that when you went to Ogilvy Yeah, so then I went um, over to... So I met my husband at McCann's. Um, It was a great place for building your social life back then. And my two best friends, uh, who are still my best friends, I met at McCann's. Um, We went... We eloped off to Australia. How exciting and romantic. (laughs) And and I was lucky enough to get uh, an account handling job at... Ogilvy and Mather, which uh, was, you know, it was pretty cool. They were in in North Sydney and I used to get the jet cat to work. I used to think I was the bee's knees, swanning yeah. off with my briefcase, past all the surfers, getting yeah. on the jet cat. Um, yeah, it was great. And worked on some really, really nice accounts. Um, Shivers Regal, um, Mum Champagne from memory. Yeah, yeah it was... Um, it was it was it was fun times, but it was really hard work. That was an era when 
Um, there was no such thing as work-life balance. It was no. sort of 12 hours a day. and Work, work um, balance. It was <laughs> that was the one, yeah. yeah. Um, so was this, uh, what, what? I mean, without wishing to... Uh, ask a you know a two person question what were you about so 25 26 at this point yeah yeah, yeah. And so why on earth would you say i've had enough of australia and sydney and the sunshine let's go back to uh you know presumably altringham or somewhere like that yeah, i know i i i sometimes when it, in january I, d- I definitely like every january think why did i come back from australia it must have been mm-hmm. crazy but you you do, you miss your own culture um i think People that are super outdoorsy uh, tend to um, settle much better in Australia. You know, if you're out, if you're out on a bike, if you're surfing, if you're doing all that stuff. Um, and but but for me, I just really miss the the, the British humour, particularly Manchester. I think we've got this unique, irreverent yep. sense of humour which I just love. Um, and uh, I miss the culture. I miss the art galleries, the history, the the windy country lanes, old buildings, all that stuff. And just the weird stuff yeah. like people saying sorry to you when you bump into them and oh stuff like God, that. Yeah, I love all that. The, the <laughs> sort of uniquely and and sort of dithering when you say goodbye to someone. You know, yeah. trying to get it right. Um, uh, all, all that, all that sort of you know, sort of stuff about British behavior that you take for granted um yeah and, uh, and all yeah. the stuff they managed to kind of i think i feel like that's all the stuff that um Ardman animations managed to distill perfectly mm-hmm. and that's why they love them in america because it gets yeah. the essence of being british yeah I, re- I read a book uh, a few years ago ago called watching the english uh it's written by a um social anthropologist and it's although it's um, a an academic work essentially. It's actually just really funny about about how other countries see our um, our this the fact that we are always on alert for humour, no matter how dark the situation. Yeah. How we just um, you know we've got this real low tolerance for earnest anyone being earnest. Yeah, you know, it's weird, it, isn't it? Yeah, um, sincerity yeah. is what we just don't do over here. Mm. No, 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 and and you can't take yourself seriously. It's just like really. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so yeah, there was there was a lot of, about that that I that I just really missed, and um, I think on the whole as well, you know, since then I've had I've had three children, and I'm I'm very happy that you know my children are are British, and and I sort of you know I think they would have been. Going, hey, good day, mom. You know, and I, I, it's like, <laughs> would have been strange having uh, yeah, having Aussie children when you're yeah. uh, very firmly from the northwest. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So, what happened after you came back? Then uh, was because I know that um, you and uh, your husband are both very, very uh, busy. You know, r- uh, both running basically uh, entirely separate and 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 you know, incredibly uh, demanding businesses. So mm-hmm. did that happen straight away when you came back? You went, let's let's go back and both be entrepreneurial hustlers or was, you know, <laughs> uh, w- you know, was there some downtime for family? How did it work? Um, so, yeah, so when we came back, um, he was, uh, he was a bit more, I probably shouldn't say this, but he was a bit more picky than me. There was only yeah. one place he was going to work and it was going to be BDH and that was it. So, he sort of sat around watching uh, the Olympics. I think it was the year that the Olympics were on. He sat around doing that and, you know, and I had to get out and earn a crust. So, <laughs> Was this the 2008, the Beijing Olympics or the ones before that, Athens? Yeah, the ones, one before. And okay. um, and I was, I was lucky. I got a job at, uh, on the client side then, um, with what was fine art, which is now studio, uh, which is interestingly, um, a, a, a chief client. So, right. so that's quite nice. And, and the, the, uh, marketing manager there mm-hmm. is someone that I worked with when I was, when I was marketing manager at, yeah. uh, uh, in that role. So, so that's, you know, that's quite a nice little sort of backlink there, but, um, but yeah, so I uh, so I then um, you know had to re- reinvent myself as a client side marketeer. 
Yeah. Um, which was interesting because, you know, there's a lot more depth to, to a client role. And I, I'd been used to this sort of flimsy overview that you, that you have in an agency. Where you um, think, oh, the client, what are they? they don't know how to make this stuff we do, you know, yeah. What do they actually yeah. do? Do they just wait to phone advertising agencies and then do nothing? <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what you think. That's all they do all day is just yeah. deal with the agency. And of course they don't, you know, you have to go and have a meeting with, with customer service who are who are going to give you grief because um, you'd put too tight a deadline on your promotion or, or you know, you'd, you'd, um, you'd hadn't created the response mechanism appropriately for them. Uh, so, uh, so yes, there, there's... Um, you know, there's a, there was a whole lot of learnings uh, required to to uh, transition into um, into a, a client side a client side job, and it was quite a big management job as well. I had a team of six and yeah. and quite a big budget. Um, and so, presumably, you've seen yeah. that uh, issue that goes all the way up the ladder, which is so. Say, okay, say that uh, we at Gas were doing a project with Chief. And then mm -hmm. we're just waiting for one person's opinion, presumably the director or something like that, who is then having to sell it up to the agency. And then the agency giving their feedback, who are having to sell it up to the marketing director at their place. Yeah. And ultimately, they have to sell it up to their boss, who's usually the chief exec. And I think it was the uh, the, the guy who go, does not go one episode of this without a mention, which is Rory Sutherland. Um, he said most people's decisions are based on the fact that they don't want to look stupid in front of their boss all the way down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, but I think the thing that, and we did have a really scary boss at the time. Right. Um, uh, I think the, uh, and it was very much a sort of male dominated um, board and, mm. and, and hierarchy. It was, it was sort of quite a, ma quite a macho environment. So this sort of like uh, 12 years ago, is it 12, 13 yeah, years ago? Yeah, quite a long time, more than that, actually. And the, 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 um, the, the, the great thing that, that I had was presentation skills because I'd worked in the agency side. So, and, and really what, what they, what they were really keen on was the numbers. So it was about, um, uh, presenting work that was going to be effective. And because I could talk about the creativity and how that was go going to be effective and I could do that confidently, that, that really helped. Um, in fact, uh, something I was chatting to with the marketing manager there um, recently was that the one of the, the spring catalogue that they did. I, I was responsible for bringing that in when I was there, and it was it was quite a major a major investment because it was always a Christmas business. So to 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 invest in that. Um, to invest in something out of season was, you know, it was, it was quite a big deal. And, yeah. and that, that now is, as as sort of continued to grow and thrive and become a really big part of the business now so that it's not, not so seasonal, I believe. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, it's quite nice to have those little legacies, isn't it? But it's um, always good you, when you feel yeah. like you're, what's the boss of, better metaphor than DNA, but to say that, yes, you left an impression that continues to this day must be gratifying. But the the thing I would be, um, what, what thing I'm, one thing I'm really interested in is what happened to you, let's say from a, like a psychological perspective, when you went over to client side to say that, you know, your, I presume your regard for agency life and agency work completely changed. And, you know, all of a sudden, Presumably you have multiple people pitching at you and then you have to choose one of them. How does that feel when you've been on both sides of it? Um, well, you have to try and not get a bit power crazed. <laughs> really? It's that easy? <laughs> so With it's kind, kind of, of emperor like, oh. gladiator thing going on. <laughs> now I can be one of those really mean clients. Yeah. Uh, that I've been on the receiving end of. No, it, it, it's, um, I think uh, it, it, it was nice. Yeah, it was nice in that you could um, you could try and be a really, you know, a really good client, give a really good brief and, you know, understand the uh, and appreciate the, you know, the creative that that's being presented to you that's in that's in front of you. And, and any feedback you give is not you know, is 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 thought through. Um, so I'd like to 
think that hopefully I was, you know, I was that kind of client. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Well, uh, I will go around and ask everyone who was responsible for new business who was pitching to you and we'll see, but no. Oh God, yeah, don't be like, <laughs> oh, bitch. It'd be good if it was, this is your life, wouldn't it? Because then we could go, and here they are now and they all come into the Zoom room. <laughs> oh no, she was the right cow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if, uh, the, the odds are, uh, well, what that means now though is when you're pitching for work, you know what it's like for them. Um... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I, I do, and uh, you know, uh, it it does it does give you that sort of insight that well, you know, that well actually, you know, I don't think I think in order to win this pitch, we need to present something more visual yes. because they're not they're not a, 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 you know a script that is just words on a page. That's that's not going to really that's not going to really do it. We're going to need to 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 give to give them. Um, you know, a really clear understanding of what we're what we're trying to achieve, and if that means we've got to invest in um, do, creating a little a little film uh, as a taster, or or um, you know, creating storyboards, then you know we'll we need to do it because that that's the way to to um, you know to get this client on board. Do you have a good radar for like when someone is? Uh, approaching you saying, can you enter a, a, a pitch for this uh, project? Do you have a good radar for what you think they will want to see? Because you know the best people going into a pitch also have a sense for what that individual who is the client wants mm. in that example you just gave. It might be if someone can't really use their visual imagination, then it sounds like you were, uh, you were intimating that it's like we have to fill in the gaps for them. They won't be able yes. to picture this if we just describe it with words. Yeah, I mean, if you're pitching to an agency, I, I mean, generally, um, you know, they're, they're obviously really good at that. But but if you're if if you're pitching to their client or a direct client, uh, then yeah. But I mean, I wish I had. To be honest, I wish I had a better radar. I, mm. I um, you know, you win I win all the work. <laughs> exactly, I'd give anything to. Have. I mean, sometimes, uh, and uh, you know, don't know whether this is the same same for you, um, but you think a, a pitch has gone really well. Um, there's been lots of engagement and really healthy discussion, and then you just don't hear anything, and and then you know, eventually, you sort of track them down, and and it's a oh no, sorry. Yeah. And, you're just thinking, what? But I thought that went so well. You well, know? did that not happen for you when you were the client? Did you have that kind of, oh, I don't really want to say no, so I just leave yeah. it? Yeah, it, it, it is awkward, but but you're just sort of prolonging the agony, aren't you? If you, you know, if you don't say, yeah. you know, if you don't offer some some honest feedback. Yeah. Um, but it's it's hard not to be emotionally invested, isn't it, when you're pitching? I think if you give if you give a pitch everything, um, you 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 can't not be emotionally invested, and then you've got to try and protect yourself in case in case you don't win it. Yeah, of course. Well, that's you know that's uh, that's how I find it anyway. <laughs> you develop a thick hide, don't you, as you go through it? And, yes. You know, hopefully, but you try so to. Uh, what was the what then brought you to Chief from uh, what was the brand called we were just discussing the fashion brand you worked for as the client? So that was Studio. Studio, and yeah. then was it Studio straight over to Chief? And when did that happen? No, no. So so after that, so I I left Studio um, uh, once I had children once started uh, having a family um it was it was quite a big commute and um just just really wasn't sort of wasn't conducive uh, and at that point um christian had my husband had set up an agency so i got involved with helping him to build the agency and uh it, it's it's sort of you know, two miles down the road from where we live. So that would, that was an, e an easier home for me professionally, yeah. uh, whilst I was bringing up the kids while they were little. And obviously, you know, it was great to be able to help Christian to build his business up. Um, and then, uh, as, as the kids got older and, if if became more successful, I sort of felt that I needed to to get out there and do my own thing again. Um, well, in that case, before yeah. we go on to Chief, that might be quite useful because, as you know, uh, since uh, the time in question, which presumably we're talking sort of 
uh, the late part of the last decade or well, the one yeah. before that. So about 2009, 2008. And... Um, since then, the conversation has become much louder about how to balance the commitments of family and of career uh, mm -hmm. for both partners. And obviously, you and uh, Christian are a good example of people who have made that balance work well. And so, do you have advice for uh, couples who are thinking, who are about my age, I'm 28, mm -hmm. so they're, who will be thinking, well, I would like to you know, get married, we'd like to have children, but we're both really intense career people and we both want it all. Do you mm -hmm. have any advice for how to to, to manage it? Oh God, uh, it, it's such a tough one. You know, it's it's really hard to, to get it right. Um, and I'm not sure we're a great example. Uh, when the, the so we've got a big age gap. So the two older kids who are both at uni, um, when they were younger, um, I, I did sort of ninety percent of uh, the childcare, and 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 my career was 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 you know it's fair to say it was on the back burner really um, yeah. for I don't know maybe eight years something like that, um, and and I you know I was okay with that. It's although there were times where I was a bit frustrated, um, you know you, you I. I made that decision to be there to to help with the homework to to be on the touchline to be in the audience at concerts and yeah. and all those all those things that you know when you're bringing children up you think they're going to go on forever you know that there's always going to you're always going to be on the touchline on a saturday morning you know yeah. but but speaking as someone whose kids are now at uni it sort of just goes like that and i think i'm i'm so i'm quite happy with with those choices and yeah. and also I've been lucky in that um I've been able to pick my career up again as as they've got you know as they've got older and uh and we've almost sort of swapped a bit in a way in that our youngest one um my husband gets a lot more involved with helping with him I think that he sort of has realized he maybe did miss out a little bit with the older ones and um you know so he will regularly do school pick up and and what have you and he's contributed with the homeschooling um so uh, so yeah but you know i'm not going to say oh you know thing to do is have two kids have a big break and then have another <laughs> <laughs> because i think it's slightly bonkers well the way you the way the way that you guys did it <laughs> yeah it's, it is slightly bonkers um so you know we've got most of our friends now are they're, they're sort of empty nesting a bit and and we've still got one just heading off into secondary school um so so yeah but uh but actually funnily enough I was chatting to one of the producers who's got two young children at, at Chief and she she's made a decision to to sort of step step back a little bit um and uh, has said uh well you know I can do what you've done I can you know I can turn the gas up um yeah you know, late once they're a bit older, so it's quite nice that that she sees that as 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 um, you know a bit of inspiration that um, yes. you you can cut your hours back a bit and then you know pick, pick it up again. I think that's exactly right, and yeah. it's 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 what we what we need to be the truth is uh, that talent uh, will not leave you, even if you take time away from nourishing and. Uh, trying to manifest the talent. And so, uh, because it's going to be a question, isn't it? A lot of uh, people will be, uh, again, around my age, will be worried that, I do, you know, people like me, for example, I do want it all. I want uh, a lot of involvement with my family and want a very productive and successful career. And a lot of, obviously, uh, it, 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 obviously women in particular who I speak to in the industry uh, who are around my age, they all, as a kind of axiom, think, well, I'll have to leave the industry if I want to uh, have children. And so it sounds like in your case, it's as long as you still have the capabilities, you still have the knowledge, uh, the, the the gap isn't going to chew you out of the marketplace. No, I, I don't think so. I, I, I believe in transferable skills. So, um, you know, I think if you if you want to reinvent yourself in a different part of the creative creative world then I don't see why you can't you know if you have great um uh sort of client service skills if you you know I, th I think it's really easy to sort of underestimate um 
uh, your experience and uh, and and even sort of gut feel really. Uh, I would uh, you know you you sort of build up a, a gut feel based on experience about about all sorts of things about um, about uh, like you were saying about pitches um, about um, brands about about recruitment um, and. Um, and, and yeah, the, you know these, that that experience and those skills are that even if they've been on the back burner, they they can be you know they can be brought out again. And yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm learning all about SEO at the moment, and I'm quite excited about that. I've, we you know, we need to improve our SEO presence at uh, our SEO ranking at Chief. So that is. Um, you know that's that's going to be my latest area of of expertise. So you can ask me about that in two months' time. I will do and, for sure. Um, we'll we'll get you back on for a for a, a live exam. But, that would uh, be really interesting. But that's another part of the optimism, isn't it? It's that the environment is always changing so much that you will never run out of ways in which you can uh, carry on learning and carry on upskilling. So it's not like once you. Uh, do you know your kind of initial career growth let's say to the age of 30 or so it's not like Mm -hmm. after that you're all done Uh, there's going to be a whole other adventure waiting for you after that yeah I think you know I think as long as you've you're open-minded you've got enthusiasm um I think the other thing is of course you you've got contacts um you know as long as you're not the kind of person who who sort of burns bridges uh, everywhere. If you, if uh, in fact, this would be, uh, I think perhaps a great bit of advice to to younger people starting out in the industry is to to keep in touch with people. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot easier now with um, social media, with LinkedIn and and what have you. But um, you know, the, the, the your your friends of of today are the CEOs of you know twenty years hence and. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, you know, you you'd be surprised at where some of the people you're working with and end up, and uh, so yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Fa- not only would I not fall out with anyone if possible, I would try and keep in touch with with people. Yeah, it, um, yeah. And people, well, uh, fundamentally, will <coughs> want to w- work with people who essentially make them feel good. You know, if you're happy when someone walks into the room, you're going to want to work with them, and the high, very high performing people on this series that I've spoken to, most of them have that quality. As soon as they're on camera, for some reason, there's something about them that brings positivity to the room. And so it's very exceptional circumstances where people will you know, respect you despite being a disagreeable type. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah, oh gosh, yeah. No, it's... Um, again, you know, going back to McCann's in, in the... Uh, a sort of account execing days, uh, you, you you know there were, it, it was you had to have different skills for different um, types of people within within the agency. You know we had an in house media part, department then, uh, and you, you, working with the media teams was completely different to working with a creative team, and um, you know though sort of getting on with those different types of people and getting the best out of them, getting them on your side. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was, that was just a, a, a sort of a great basis really. And I, uh, I think it's, um, you know, it's perhaps a skill that, um, that is maybe overlooked a bit, uh, is, is, as you say, you know, getting on with people, making people feel good about themselves and, um, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Easy to be around and solves problems. Those tend to be the two big categories as, uh, in my experience. But um, uh, the, I wanted to jump back onto the rail of when you went back to Chief. And, or when I say back, went to Chief after, uh, you know, something of a, uh, a career hiatus. I've got the chronology right there, haven't I? It was a career hiatus and then Chief. Mm, yeah. And were you straight in as commercial director at Chief? Uh, no, I started off as... Um, sales and marketing director and uh it was it was a new role at chief so that there hadn't been anyone in a in in a create in a marketing or well basically in a non-shoot 
uh, role. Uh, so, it, so it was all produce, producers and, and directors. So um, it, there was a lot of pressure, really, not from the founders, but but from myself to to prove that role, to prove that that it that it could function, that it was that it had a, a worth, that it had a value, um, that you could bring you know, that you could bring clients in um, without them just coming to you. Um, yeah. And uh, the Is that what it was at Chief before you arrived? It was all inbound from existing relationships? Well, uh, I, yeah, kind of. I mean, you know, Col- Colin in particular is extremely well known in the industry yeah. and, there are, you know, there's 20 years worth of relationships there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it was a case of, well, you know, let's... We, we, you know, if we want to grow the business, if we want to pursue particular genres and perhaps relationships with agencies that we don't currently work with, um, then maybe, you know, maybe you could have a go at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and while you're at it, can you do a few tweets? Yeah. Um, so, so that was how that started off. And, um, you know, I, I had that, that, that awful imposter syndrome, you know, yes. I got in and thought, Oh God, what's this old gal doing here with all these young trendy people? And, uh, they're going to realize that, um, they don't need me. I can't do the job, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, I, that, that's, <laughs> I, I can only suspect that's in the post <coughs> for people even at my age, forgive me, because already I'm like, uh, I feel like it's wrong for me to try and use TikTok. I think that ship has sailed. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, feel, I feel like when maybe when you came in, you were like, you know, oh, I'm supposed to be able to mingle in this social media world and get all this stuff out, but you pick it up, don't you? So Yeah, you do, you do. And, and actually, um, you know, often letting the uh, the... The, the sort of juniors loose on social media uh, is can be ill-advised, really. I think there's a bit of a balance. Um, struck, yeah. Well, this yeah. is... So I, I read... Um, I, I've got a, a, another significant question to get onto, but just as a brief tangent, I read a great piece by uh, Paul Burke. Do you know Paul Burke? He's an um, advertising copywriter. Yeah, I, in fact, I just watched the having gas with him the other day. He's <laughs> funny, isn't he? He, oh, he comes across really well. Yeah, well, he's the he's he has the kind of personality that you would expect from someone to develop, uh, you know, from someone who's worked with Victoria Wood and Rowan Atkinson and all these great wow. people. You know, if as soon as you're working with stars, you probably have to get into you know, you fill fill a bit more space, don't you? So. Yeah, um, I did. I, it did make me think. Oh, I hope I've not got a squeaky, high pitched voice because. <laughs> Apparently, people switch off straight away. So, no, no. Well, I, I doubt that'll be the case with you. But anything, just listening to your own voice is never recommended. And I, I, I can, I can speak more than most about that. But um, yeah. So he, he, he uh, wrote a big piece in the Spectator about tone of voice because he was talking about how the, how he helped to launch the Innocent Smoothie brand, and uh, subsequently everything now has you know, wackaging. You know where all the. Uh, all the packaging is really kind of coy and cutesy. And, oh, yeah. yeah. It's sort of, it's become a bit cringy, hasn't it? Yeah. And so point being there uh, is, you know, I'd never really got why tone of voice is important. Mm-hmm. And like you're saying, you can't just let anyone who is anyone run the social media account for an agency if you're not communicating how that agency behaves. Oh, I know. Yeah. I mean, I you know, I'd like to think that we haven't done that that I'm aware of, but you do look at some social feeds and think, oh my God, that's like someone's just vomited into Instagram. <laughs> you know? got like, hey guys, you know, in this really kind of ch- chummy tone of voice and loads of emojis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you, you have to be really, you have to be really careful, don't you? I mean, I've read something in Prol- Prolific North, really, I won't go into the detail, but, you know, it can be a, it can be a uh, you know, a resignation um, issue if you get yeah. it wrong, can't it? It, you know, can be yeah. a, a big deal. Yes, uh, but presumably you got over that imposter syndrome and, you know, you're bringing work in and, you know, the, what's the word? You know, when you get over, to, when you get over that imposter syndrome and you suddenly fill, fill your boots, so to speak, you know, and you feel in the right place. Uh, it struck me when we were talking about, you know, what the narrative of your life had been. Uh, you reminded me a little bit of my own uh, mother, not in a bad way, which is to say that I felt like she was always pushing uphill. And every time it felt like she was at the top, it was a false summit. And there was another huge, 
way to go. And uh, in your case, it sounds like as soon as everything was settled and 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 in a good place, uh, you were uh, confronted with another uh, pretty substantial challenge in, in your life. Yeah, um, y- yeah, you're right. I, I just sort of got over imposter syndrome, got some really nice clients in, like the Leith Agency from Scotland. I love working with those guys. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I I was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer in, in 2018. So I don't, I don't even the job sort of nine months, I yeah. think. And uh, it was a real shock. It was like, what in, what are you talking about? I can't I can't have cancer. I've, I've got stuff just, to do. Yeah, I've only just worked out how to do my job, and yeah. um, I've, I don't have the time for it. I'm really sorry, but no, <laughs> yeah. can you come back in ten years? I'm just a bit busy now. Yeah. Uh, so um, so yeah, it, it was it was a real shock, and um, uh, I was fortunate in that. Well. You know, obviously, I was fortunate in that I'm still here. In that yeah. it was it, it was treatable, uh, but but unfortunate in that it was bad enough to necessitate, um, as my consultant calls it, the, you know, having the kitchen sink thrown at you, yeah. uh, which was the the most sort of brutal um, chemo and surgery and the lot. Uh, but I was I was fortunate in that the the two founders at Chief were were happy for me to carry on working because I just said, look, you know, if I I want to give it a go, I want to, uh, I want to try and work through this. Uh, You know, a lot of people will sort of, you know, climb into a black hole and emerge 12 months later, but, but that, that definitely wasn't how I wanted to tackle it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, it, it was, um, it was tough, but, um, uh, I think, you know, it, it, um, to get a little bit philosophical here, uh, something that's been a companion for me in this last lockdown is um, a book by, uh, what's he, let me have a look, got it here, by Viktor Frankl. Man's Search for uh, Meaning. Man's Search yep. for Meaning. Have you ever read it? No, it's, and, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been recommended to me and it's exactly the kind of literature I... Um, I'm happy you produced that for us, yeah. Right, okay. Well, it's uh, I've always fancied getting into, into Nietzsche, but yeah. I've not really had the cerebral capacity for it. And Nietzsche is impossible to read. It's just yeah. like trying to wade through treacle. <laughs> well, um, this book is like a sort of uh, Nietzsche for numpties. <laughs> <laughs> Frankel, and, Nietzsche uh, for numpties on, on the tombstone. <laughs> and... Uh, um, it's it's about how suffering how you how it can give your life meaning and yeah. how it you know it, it can be actually be quite helpful to you and I sort of look back and I feel really proud of uh, of how I cope with with that with that suffering and uh, you know and sort of dealt with it and, and conquered it and and didn't let it um, uh, take my career away from me yeah uh, which, and it- which it, you know, had the potential to do. Well, it sounds as well like the carrying on working through it um, and the same thing happened uh, with my mother, in fact, was uh, it gives you the substantial meaning that you need to get through that kind of uh, that kind of suffering and that kind of uh, overwhelming uh, bad news. It's like you still need something to grip onto that's going to pull you through it. And in your case, it was the job that you had just uh, gotten comfortable with. Yes, yeah, exactly that. I mean, you know, there were there were some physical challenges and, you know, and some and you know, there was a need for that sort of gallows humor here and there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember the first day I went into because I hadn't told many people because I didn't want to be I, I didn't want sympathy, I didn't want to be treated any any differently by anyone. Um so I kept it to a really, you know, a tight number of people that knew about it until I lost my hair I mean obviously you've then got a physical challenge and um I'd spent a fortune on a wig uh I mean to this day I haven't told Christian how much it cost I don't I, I think he might balk at it um I spent an absolute absolute fortune on getting this blonde bob which is quite similar to what I'm sporting now 
and uh, and it, it is really weird. It, your hair does literally fall out overnight. You sort of no get way. up in the morning and it's just all on your pillow. And um, sorry, it's a bit graphic, that isn't it? But <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I uh, so I then had to go in in the in the really expensive blonde bob wig on the Monday. And uh, I thought, is anyone going to notice? Hopefully no one's going to notice, you know. And uh, as I walked into the office, uh, one of my colleagues looked up and said, oh, Karen, your hair, is that a wig? (laughs) (laughs) In front of everyone. And I was like, thanks, thanks for that. I was hoping to make it through until lunchtime, but, you know, yeah. So presumably that's a script ready for the comedy directors already. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So, um, so I had to come clean then and and sort of let people know. But um, but yeah. So there was a few, there was a few challenges, but but on the whole, it you know it was fine. And I would um, you know I'd sort of joke about being in my Christie office on a Friday, and uh, thankfully it wasn't Zoom then. So you know I could be on the phone and you know typing away, and no nobody had any idea. Uh, where I was communicating from. <laughs> wow. And so you were, st- you, you had set up a remote working office at the Christie at getting the Christie. cancer treatment. Yeah, it was funny. And on the, on the days that my husband came with me, he'd be sat there with his laptop uh, and I'd just be, and I'd be sort of slagging him off to the nurses saying, look at him, he's supposed to be running around getting me a cup of tea and checking <laughs> I'm all right. And he's just busy doing his email and what stuff. And so... <laughs> When uh, was the last time that you were in any kind of treatment and where are we now? So, um, so that I've been two, two years of clear scan. So we're moving in the right direction. Yes, thank you. Um, so the, the, sort of, the stats are going in my favour. Uh, and, and yeah, no, so there's, we're, I've been free of treatment for about a year and a half now. Um, so yeah, all my own hair here now. Brilliant. Desperately in need of a good cut at the moment, but <laughs> middle, middle of April, isn't it? Yeah, um, and so you know. <laughs> what, what, what is it? What's the what's the number we're waiting for? Is it official five years clean? Is that when it's all done? Yeah, yeah. So so you you probably know about this um, with your mum, but yeah, I think once you get to five years, your your uh, you know the stats are definitely you know they're definitely moving in the right direction for you. And um, but my my consultant was was absolutely brilliant. Uh, once he had all the information uh, that he needed, he was able to confidently say to me, right, we are looking at a cure here um, uh, and we're going to re- restore your natural life expectancy. So, um, he, you know, he was amazing. And he, he uh, this guy called Lester Barr, who's a founder of Prevent Breast Cancer, uh, the charity, I don't know if you've heard of it. but We helped uh, Christian's agency out with a little film about that and I didn't know that's why they were involved. Oh, so right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, we'd, you know, we're, I'd like to get more involved with with Prevent uh, as, as time allows um, in terms of helping them and supporting fundraising events and yeah. what have you. It's, it's a brilliant charity. Yeah, well, we're all on board here, so let us know if you need a hand with any of that. But uh, oh, good, thank you. It's all good. And the great news is here you still are. Here you are working away, and it's presumably not long until you're going to be back in the building just down the road. Yes, yeah. Oh, I forgot you're just down the road, aren't you? Um, yeah, I love being. I love working in Media City. Do you? It's, uh, yeah, it's been. Vibe. It's been strange. Now we're you know since since lockdown, it's got a, a, a like a dystopian um <laughs> like a, 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 what would you say you know you can imagine a story in which you'd been placed in a simulation by extraterrestrials and you couldn't figure <laughs> out how to get out of it it's like that big empty completely modern made you know new city yeah it, it is isn't it if you compare that to a few years ago you know we had that really hot summer and the bbc yeah. had all the deck chairs out yeah. it, was, it was like being in barcelona wasn't it it was. And, uh, you, you'd go and grab a sandwich and a drink, sit in a jet deck chair, watch the world go by. It was amazing. Uh, you know, forward wind a couple of years. And like mm. say, it's like some kind of dystopian, especially on a day when the winds got up. You yeah, know. which happens a lot around here. But no, one of, the, <laughs> one of the best days around here in my memory was, you know, coming out of here, going down to the dockyard in the middle of the the, the, the warm kind of thick 
uh, English summer, getting a beer and then walking over to Old Trafford for the Rolling Stones. That was uh, one of the best days we've had around here. Yeah, nice. I bet that was brilliant. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and, you know, it might it might never get back to that if if the, uh, our friends at the BBC don't, don't sort of fully return. Um, and, you know, and, and who knows whether they, whether they will or not. But, we'll um, see, won't we? But obviously yeah. in times of, um, in times of uh, extreme uh, chaos and uh, upheaval, uh, I, I think it's uh, probably safer... Not for me, I find it safer not to make predictions. So I, I hope that we'll be uh, seeing them all coming back. Uh, oh, I do. Yeah. yeah, I'm desperate to see the lanyards everywhere. Yeah, um, uh, yeah it, it's um, yeah, yeah. You've got to hope that that we're going to get we're going to get that normal back, haven't you? Um, yeah. But I love being in Media City. I love the the vibe at Chief. Uh, we've got a huge studio there. And um, when there's a, you can't be a shoot day at, at Chief with, um, you know, all the energy and uh, crazy stuff going on. Um, yeah. So fingers crossed. <laughs> Amazing. So, it, and with when with that uh, on that note, on the idea of maybe getting back to normal and things starting to return, it's the first week of school. It's uh, uh, or the first week that people have been allowed back to school in the year 2021 and it's three o'clock and uh, that means I think you told me that you had to uh, yeah has it been an hour already it has it's indeed quickly hasn't it I've really enjoyed chatting to you it's been I'm glad great. to hear you say that many people say oh it's only been an hour so <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's been great. Right. Yes. I better go and pick the little one up. Um, <laughs> hadn't I? So, uh, yeah, oh, it's just, it's just been a joy. The kids being back. Um, that's just phase one of normal right there, isn't it? Phase one indeed. So I look forward to the next few phases, but, um, I have no doubt we'll be speaking again soon. So, uh, uh, you know, have a, a great rest of your day and, uh, let's hope that, you know, things are, uh, returning to, you know, a pleasant status quo for you real soon. Oh, thank you very much. All right. <laughs> See you.